The theme of today's session is around diversity and inclusion, and it's really just to sort of give you examples or showcase some of the work that's going on in the college, particularly around embedding diversity and inclusion into course design um, as part of our curricula. And I'm delighted today that we've got um, a student from the School of Life Sciences that's been working on developing such a project who's going to give us a, an overview of what she's been involved in later on. And um, also Karen is here from the vet school to talk about other approaches that we're using in the vet school. So my name's Lubna Nasser. I chair the College Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee and I'm also the Associate Head for Diversity and Inclusion in the Vet School. So I'm just going to kick off with a, a, a brief overview on why we think it's important and go over some of the, the terminology before I pass on to my colleagues. And then we'll be more than happy to take any questions that you have um, at the end of the session. So as I said, today we've got School of Life Sciences giving us an overview of their work as well as the School of Veterinary Medicine. And, and I think many of you will know that the university and indeed the college has a very strong commitment to equality, diversity and inclusion. And the university has an equality statement that you, you can find on the university web pages and it states that we as an institution are committed to promoting equality in all of our activities and aim to provide a work, learning, research and teaching environment that's free of any form of discrimination or unfair treatment. And I think as an institution we very much value equity, inclusion and dignity for all our staff and all our students. And the university as a whole recognises that we all have a role to play in that. So the staff have an important role to play, but so, so does the, the student body. And, and that's one of the reasons why we're interested in embedding diversity and inclusion into the, the curricula, particularly in our college. So what do we mean by equality? So in the UK, Equality is backed by legislation, and this is under the Equality Act of 2010. And this basically means that it's unlawful to discriminate against a number of protected characteristics. And there are nine protected characteristics that are listed here. Sexual orientation, sex, maternity and pregnancy, race, religion or belief disability, marriage, civil partnership, age and gender reassignment. So the Equality Act is really protecting individuals that identify with those characters, characteristics and ensuring that there's opportunity for fostering good relations between different um, groups of individuals. Our approach across the university and particularly in the school, in the college, is really about, oh sorry if I'm going the wrong way, it's really about equity. And I've got this slide here which just, and I think it's important to recognise the difference between equality and equity. And as you can see on this slide, if we look at the upper part of this diagram, if you have several individuals and they're setting out on a particular journey and you equip them with precisely the same instrument to, to go on that journey, then you can see that some individuals are potentially disadvantaged. So an individual that's perhaps a wheelchair user is not going to be able to go on the same journey, reach the same destination as somebody that perhaps doesn't use a wheelchair. Also, a child, you can see in this image here, a child is not going to be able to achieve the same goal as perhaps somebody that 
is more suitable to ride that particular bike. And when we talk about equity, we're talking about really equipping individuals, providing the support, providing the tools for each and every individual to achieve that same goal so that every individual can move along the same journey and have the same attainment at, at the end. So by equipping individuals with their necessary skills, tools or support to, to reach that end goal. And I think it's important that we, we make that, that distinction here and it's something we're striving to do in the college. So what do we mean by diversity and inclusion? Well, diversity is when we recognize and value difference. And in its broadest sense, it's about creating cultures that value difference and they recognize difference and that's for everybody's benefit. Inclusion more specifically refers to how somebody feels valued in their workplace and or whether it's their, their study environment and how they feel included. And that can extend to wider society as well. So these three terms are different things. However, we need to progress them together because you will only have equality or equity of opportunity if we recognize and recognize difference and value the, the importance of ensuring everybody's voice is included. Um, it, it's very obvious, there's lots of data that tells us diversity and inclusion is important. It's important because if you're part of a marginalized group or a minority group, then that can be isolating. And again, there is evidence that tells us that individuals that aren't perhaps feeling valued or included in their workplace, that can affect their productivity. But it can also affect the pr productivity or the outcomes of an organization. So it's really important for everybody's individual success to feel included and to be valued for the contribution they make. And I think it's also important that we all have a responsibility in, in ensuring that we dispel negative stereotypes and personal biases based on, on different groups. So these are all reasons why we think it, it's really key to embed into our core curriculum. And it also helps us recognize ways of being that are not necessarily our own and respect those different ways of being. And there's a growing body of evidence that tells us that there is a really strong relationship between diverse teams and outcomes, whether that's productivity um, or financial gain. So diverse teams solve problems quicker, they are more productive, and in, in research it's been demonstrated as well that more diverse teams, from uh, particularly of ethnic diverse authors, are, have much better outcomes in, ter in terms of research citations. So there's a lot of evidence that tells us that there's, a, there's value in making sure that individuals are included and valued. Now the school, the university, sorry, has a number of equality champions and this really demonstrates the commitment of the university in, in supporting equality and diversity across these protected characteristics. And the overall equality champion is the principal and vice chancellor, Professor Sir Anton Muscatelli. And we have an additional eight equality champions within the university. And you can find all the details for these individuals on the university web pages, on the human resources web pages. So these cover all of the protected characteristics. And more recently, we've appointed two new champions, one for mental health and also a refugee champion. So those of you who are interested, I definitely suggest you have a look at the, the web pages there. One area of activity that has been a particular focus for not just the university but the college perhaps over the last 
seven, eight years has been gender equality. And this is through a charter known as the Athena Swan Charter, and some of you may, may have heard that. You might have seen the, the logo on some university communications. And this is a, a charter, a UK-wide charter, that recognises a commitment to gender equality in institutions like, like universities. And initially, when the Athena Swan Charter was established, it was focused on STEM disciplines, so science, technology, engineering, maths, medicine. But since it's been expanded to include the arts, and since the expansion, there's been a focus on in involving students in that process. And the university and the college have all been working really quite hard over the last several years at making sure that we are addressing some of the gender inequalities in our, um, in our, in our institutions. And there are three levels of awards. A bronze, which demonstrates a, a commitment to gender equality. A silver award, which is the second level. And this demonstrates it's, but you have to provide evidence that you are making positive impact in addressing some of the inequalities. And then there's a gold award. The gold award is the top level award. And this is demonstrating outstanding progress. And I'm really proud and all of my colleagues in the college we've been really successful in attaining Athena Swan awards across all the schools and institutes within the college the school of life sciences have currently hold a bronze and I, I have no doubt that they will be successful in achieving a silver um, very soon and all of the other schools and institutes currently hold silver awards. So they're clearly demonstrating that we're making positive progress in addressing gender equality. And in particular, we have one institution, one institute that currently holds a gold award. So this is really, really, really amazing work that's going on, that's outstanding, making outstanding um, progress. And the, each one of the schools and institutes has what we call self-assessment teams. Some of them go under different names, but essentially the work around gender equality is driven by these self-assessment teams and there is student representation on those, those um, self-assessment teams. And it's an opportunity, therefore, for students that have an interest to get involved. You can get involved in your school or your institute, um, the work around equality, diversity and inclusion. And in recent years, many of the self-assessment teams across the, college, ac across the college have moved beyond just looking at gender. So we've taken a much broader approach and that's something that we've, we've encouraged our, all our institutes and colleges to do is to take a much broader approach to diversity and inclusion. As part of this, there's a robust self-assessment that takes place and from that we develop action plans and our students are very much involved in, in that. So it's a really nice, good opportunity if, if this is something that's of interest to you. So this is my last slide before I hand over to, to my colleague. So again, just going back to the, the sort of main point of this, why do we think it's important to embed diversity and inclusion into curricula? Well, I think we recognize that the students of today, you students that are here and, and watching remotely, you are the managers, business owners, leaders, decision makers of the future. And therefore you have or will have the opportunity to influence the diversity and in inclusion initiatives in your place of work. So I think it's really important that we as an institution help you develop those skills and those tools and give you the confidence and the knowledge to be able to go out and make a change in society. And Ultimately, 
we, we need to see an, a long-term change in terms of inequalities, not just within the workforce, but within wider society. And, and as I say, I think you know, our students are our key part of that process. As I said earlier, it's well established that there's a strong business case for diversity and inclusion. And I think as you come towards the end of your degree programs and you start to look for, for jobs, you will see that many employers are now looking for some evidence of engagement with equality and diversity. So again, what we're hoping to do is provide some sort of personal skills development that are aligned to um, employability. So thank you very much for, for listening to me. I'm now going to hand over to one of my colleagues, Karen, who's going to talk you through some of the work that's ongoing in the school. Thank you. Thank you, Libna. Okay, thank you very much. Nice to see you here today. My name is Karen McEachran, and I'm um, a vet. I work at Glasgow Vet School um, for 15 years I was an equine vet, and now I run the wildlife conservation courses at the vet school. But one of my main passions is um, working with students, and especially I've been running the outreach program there for about 15 years. So it's been, I've been very lucky to be able to become part of the diversity and inclusion team. So I'm deputy associate head of diversity and inclusion, so I work closely with Lubna. And I'm also a race equality champion at the School of Veterinary Medicine. So what I'd like to do today is talk you through some of the um, different resources and um, programs that we have within the School of Veterinary Medicine. So in the School of Veterinary Medicine, we have two undergraduate degrees, the Bachelor of Veterinary Medicine and Surgery, which is a five-year course. And then we also have the Veterinary Bioscience course, which is a four-year honors course. With an extra year, you can um, continue to get your master's degree. There are four um, MSc courses, which are all online at the School of Veterinary Medicine. So Wildlife and Livestock Management, Advanced Practice in Vet Nursing, One Health, and Animal Nutrition. We also have um, many different PhD programs and they're within the vet school and also collaborative with other institutes and schools within the university. So I'll talk a little bit about the programs that we have for diversity inclusion in these. In the veterinary course, we embedded a unconscious bias training last year. So it's run for one year and we're just running our second version of it. So it's always in first year. And what we did with this is um, there's an introduction to explain to the first year students what unconscious bias is. We have four scenarios, which you can see down at the bottom. There's a picture here of our actors acting out some scenarios where bias is implied or implicit. Then the students watch these and try to decide what the bias is and what they could do about it. The students are asked to write a reflection which they put in their portfolio. It's called an asset, and it's something they have to fill in several assets over the years for their portfolios. And this is submitted at the end, and it's part of their final mark in final year. So they write a reflection about unconscious bias, what they understand about it, and also if, they've, um, if they have come across any of this. And the answer really should be yes, because everybody has some sort of bias. And there's also a quiz about it. We did some, took some statistics from last year's class, and the questions were, has unconscious bias increased my understanding? So if you look at the first column here, the light blue color is where they strongly agree. So training has helped, so it's agree and disagree um, are the majority here. Also that um, it's helped awareness in making 
impact decisions and behaviors. Again, they say the training has helped with that. About 50-50 um, for understanding how psychological process results in unconscious bias. Possibly less found it helpful writing a reflection and that flags up um, not alarm bells, but we need to concentrate on that to maybe think of a better way to get the students to understand what this means. So this is very, very positive, but it also gives us room for improvement. So like I said, that was introduced in the BVMS course last year, and we're running it again this year. But we want to build this um, throughout the course. So in BVMS 2, the second year of the veterinary course, we're going to introduce cultural competence. So this will probably be introduced in the second term because of COVID, everything's been moved back a bit. But we'd like to talk about um, culture, understanding, the awareness of this. So we use this analogy of the cultural iceberg, which shows at the top, these are things that are very transparent. So in different cultures, there's foods, fashion, holidays, music, literature, language. But what we want people to become aware of are things that aren't so tangible. So if you look underneath the water, all of these different things in the deep culture, which is um, the way people use body language, the different um, types of pastimes, um, how they respect their elders, all the different interactions we're not necessarily aware of when we look at a person or their culture. So in doing this, we want to make the students more aware of something called microaggressions, so that's um, sort of covert statements that are very upsetting, but people might say them and don't realize it. Or there's things called macroaggressions, or which, more, which are much more overt. So we just want people to become aware of these things. Also privilege, there's a lot of people who don't realize that all of these um, microaggressions are going on. So people need to understand that even though you're not experiencing it, other people may be. Um, Lubna's already mentioned the protective characteristics, but we need people to be aware of these, to be aware that they're not saying something that's upsetting people, and to make them feel welcome. Um, inclusive language, we're putting together something just now on inclusive language for the students, and it's to make sure that terms are not used that are harmful or upsetting to other people. And we do it without meaning it, but it's something that is not tolerable anymore. We really have a zero tolerance for this now. To do this, we also would like students to volunteer to talk about some of their experiences, because I think this is probably the best way to have any student experience is the best for other students to relate to, as opposed to someone like us talking about it. So we'll get permission from students to, to video these, and that'll be part of the program that we use in the second year of the BVMS course. We also have developed a Moodle page for the students for diversity and inclusion. We have one for staff as well. This is very inclusive. We have a lot of different parts to it. Um, we have several members of staff that are champions um, that have put these um, resources together for the students. Um, it's not just a resource base. We also have a lot of live events going on. Um, so the students are invited to take part in these, but this is also very much for the students, so we want them to put their input into this. So this is just going live this term, but you can see down at the bottom we have Athena Swan Charter talking about gender equality. We have um, the diversity and inclusion committees. We both have one for staff and another diversity and inclusion committee for students, but we invite the students on to the staff diversity and inclusion um, meetings as well, so there's lots of interaction between these. There are other student grou groups that are very active. We have one group called the IVSA, which is the International Vet Student Association, and they, this, their whole remit is to exchange between um, other countries. Obviously, that's not possible just now, but they are still putting fantastic things on Facebook and getting students included in all sorts of diversity inclusion things. Even, for example, um, they're running a Christmas drive just now where they're having people bring in just a box of things. They give you a list of things, and it's to go to old people's home. So obviously they're going to collect these, 
put them aside for a couple of weeks before they can go to the home, but they're just trying to be inclusive to everyone. They're very, very dynamic, so that's why it's really, really important to get students involved in this. Unconscious bias, like I said, we've brought this into the course, and there's more resources on this on the Moodle pages. Uh, neurodiversity is very, very important. We have a member of staff who's a champion for this, and he's very um, outspoken about it and very, very supportive. And we, between himself and Lubna and I, we, have two, we are hiring members of staff to actually put more resources on this. So they've just got ISSF funding for that. And so have we, so we'll get a member of staff that comes in and will help us put all these resources on Moodle pages and help with live events. Race equality, um, I've been chosen to do that with another colleague, Noelia Eusta. We've put a lot of resources on. We've already run a couple of events, especially for um, Black History Month, which was October. In America, Black History Month is February, so we're going to do more events then because we have about 25% American students at the vet school. And um, we also uh, had a sort of panel of people come in and speak about Black Lives Matters as well. So we think that we need to show that we're not just paying lip service to this, that we're interested, that we are making sure that everybody is aware of this. Sexual orientation, we have a champion for this. There's a lot of resources here. All of these members of staff are available if students want to speak to them as well. It's not just a blank page that they go to. It's a living um, document, but also the members of staff there to, to be behind it and to back people up. There's a new thing that we're introducing into the VET course just this year. A colleague and myself have thought that we need to bring a lot of these sort of soft skills, although I don't like that term very much, but there's sort of the non-tangible skills into the veterinary course. And we, we've called it vet life skills. And it's just introducing things that are, again, on a Moodle page, but lots and lots of live events. And it gets the students involved. In fact, we've started it, but we really want the input from the students. And luckily, so far, we have had that. The students seem to be really interested in, in keeping um, us, the flow of information between us and them. So in the first couple of years of the course, which is called the foundation course, um, we've got this Moodle page set up. We've just had all the students invited, and that went live today. And we're going to introduce it into the first year in December. And we'll be talking about community and respect, diversity and inclusion, because we have this Moodle page, and we want to make sure that they're aware of it, and all of the different things, uh, different projects that we have going in diversity and inclusion. Obviously, right now, self-care and stress management is really, really important. The students are fantastic in keeping the conversation going between each other. And also, we, seem, we feel that we have a good relationship with the students in the vet school, um, but we want to make sure that they know everywhere they can go for any sort of um, student support, but also what they can do for themselves and what they can do for each other. So we have a very strong program here. Personal management is for themselves, but also financial management. These times can be very difficult for students, so we have resources for that where students can look up how they can get help financially. Building resilience, it's a very important thing that we need in the veterinary profession, and um, a lot of these students feel like they have imposter syndrome, which is quite normal, but it's really, really worrying. So we have different types of resilience. We have speakers coming in to speak to the students about this on live Zoom at the moment, but hopefully in person in the future. Communication skills are very important. That's something that runs throughout the veterinary course. And it's something that um, we put great emphasis on, and the students seem to engage fully with this. But we need to keep the um, channels of communication open at all times. We have a fantastic student group that are um, running student different types of um, peer support. We have a group that have been trained to do peer support for other students, and they, uh, their doors are open 24-7. We also have staff that are there for support for students, and the students have just um, taken on another type of support, which has come from America, and they're running a program over a couple of weeks where they're running support discussions, and then these discussions move out further and further. So it's another way that students are supporting each other. Um, there's lots of live, on, live online events 
that will be um, opened up to the students. And again, hopefully much in the future, there'll be live events face to face. So these resources are on the Moodle page, but also are pointed to other resources as well. The School of Veterinary Medicine has a One School Many Voices workshop. So we've had three so far. The first one, Lubna, ran in March 2018 on intersectionality. So talking about gender and race and uh, sort of bridging these divides within the School of Veterinary Medicine, but, but more within communities. So it's uh, very important that we can have people come up, talk about their experiences, and then other people feel w sort of that they're able to talk about their experiences as well. The second one was in March, just before lockdown, on career development. And these were people who had different protective characteristics and talked about how they were able, able to overcome those and progress in their career. It was a fantastic one. I went to that one. I was really, really moved by uh, the, the hurdles that people had to come across to, to go forward in their career. The third one we had was a Black Lives Matter panel discussion. And we had several vets um, from different ethnic minorities who spoke about how they have progressed in the profession, the hurdles that they've had to go through, but also the things they've done. So that was a fantastic, really, really lively discussion. We just started a book club. Um, this is for the School of Veterinary Medicine, but we opened it up to Black History Month for the whole university. And the first book was on microaggressions. That was October. Uh, the end of October for Black History Month. Again, we'd like to get students involved in this. It doesn't have to be books. I mean, who reads books anymore? My students say that they haven't read a book in five years. So it can be films, podcasts, whatever. So we would like to get this, just the students talking about this. We had a lecture for Black History Month that was also part of the university's um, biennial Mar Macomb Memorial Lecture. And we were very lucky to have the president of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons come and speak about her life. Um, she gave a really warm, entertaining uh, description of her early life. She had a lovely, supportive family. And she was always told she could do whatever she wanted to do. And she has. And um, she never, ne she lived in London when she was young moved to Trinidad. She said she never came across any discrimination until she came to Scotland to do her veterinary degree. And then she was shocked by the amount of discrimination that she came across. So it was a really nice talk. She was honest and open. She has very strong views of what she's going to do with the veterinary profession as her year as president of Royal College. And we had a nice discussion afterwards with members there. Um, this is what I've been involved with, I think it's about 15 years now. I've been running the Widening Participation Program at the Vet School. We have a government program called the REACH Program, and this is funded by the Scottish Funding Council, the Scottish Government, and Glasgow University puts money into it as well. And what we do is we target students from the west of Scotland. Edinburgh covers the other coast. We both sort of move up into the island, so we cover the Hebrides as well. And these students come from about 96 schools. It differs every year. And they come from the sort of low, um, the sort of deprived areas of the west of Scotland. So if you just look at this map here below, the blue areas are the affluent areas and the red areas are the ones of called, it's called Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. And that's based on your income, your health, the different services available in your area. And you can see here in Glasgow, we have a high percentage of deprivation in the city. So th these students do not have the same um, opportunities than children in schools of, in the more affluent areas possibly because they don't have the same support at home. They maybe don't have the same um, physical capabilities. Also, they don't have the financial capabilities as well. So we go in, we identify the schools. Within the schools, we now look at the postcodes where the students live. 
and we help them get into any profession. Originally, it was just the professions such as medicine, vet medicine, and dentistry, but we've opened it up to the arts, humanities, social sciences now. So what we do with these students, we see them in S4. If they're interested in vet medicine specifically, they come to an open day and we speak to them. We tell them what they need to get into vet school. And then um, we work with them over the next several years. If they are still on track with the grades to come get into vet school, we see them in S5 for a week. They come to the vet school and we run a summer school. In the summer school, they um, have opportunities to try everything that vet students do. They do clinical exam of animals. They do suturing on practice pads. They hear from vets. They do communication skills. They go to the farm. So they get a real good taster of what it's like to be a, a vet. But the most important thing is we have our vet students that have already come through the REACH program speak to them all week long, and they tell them everything about the vet course, warts and all, so that they're aware of how tough it is, that sometimes it can be um, very lonely, but they, you want these students to be absolutely sure that they want to become vets. But it's a fantastic program. We also see them again in the sixth year. We do an interview workshop with them because a lot of schools in their areas don't even give them that sort of support. So we talk to them about how to do an interview. They don't know the questions that are going to be asked, but they know how to present themselves. Our vet students are, are part of every bit of this. We also now have a link between all of the vet schools in the UK. We have a working group and we meet regularly and we talk about what each school is doing and, and bounce ideas off each other. I just put this picture up and we did have permission from the students. This was our very first cohort of REACH students about um, eight years ago now. And the girl here has gone on to become a vet. She's worked in Southern Africa. She started up free clinics for cats and dogs, and she's done amazingly well for herself. And just behind her is another student who got straight A's throughout the veterinary course and has gone on to work in oncology. So these students have gone on to do well. We also have a, more of an outreach into the community. We have um, set up a collaboration with the University of Illinois in Purdue, and there's a program called This Is How We Roll, and what we're realizing is we need to target um, pupils right down into nursery age, primary school age. So the University of Purdue has done all of this. They've got a fantastic teaching program. They've got lesson plans. They've got teaching material. So we've signed up to work with them. And then we'll take this material, have to adapt it a little bit for this country, and we're going to take that out into the community. We're also working with Into University, which are setting up hubs there's two planned for Scotland. Um, I believe that the one in Govan, Kevin, you might even be able to comment on this, is going to go ahead, whereas the one in Mary Hill is just on hold temporarily. And these are community centers where we can go out into the communities with the vet students and talk to them about becoming vets. So again, this is, um, we want the students to be very much involved in these. In the BSc and the MSc programs, we want to do the same sort of thing with them. We're going to speak to them and things that are good attributes for once they graduate, for in the workplace. So again, same sort of programs to raise awareness about diversity and inclusion, and then to talk about the sensitivity and respect that you need for each other, um, people to, be, to understand that they need to be open and adaptable to all the different types of protected characteristics open up the channels of communication, and then this would lead to collaboration and team building. So that's our plans for the future to bring this into these programs. And that's the end of mine. Thank you very much. I'm just going to clean, clean this off. I'll go ahead and open up yours. Okay, can you all hear me? I have never given a presentation here before. 
Okay, so my name is Anna Maria. I am a third year neuroscience student um, and I was working on the School of Life Sciences Equality and Diversity project since uh, March. And now I am very glad to present this project to you. So I was not working on this project alone. Uh, I was working with a fantastic team. So I was working with Dr. Nicola Veitch, Dr. Victoria Patterson and with Dr. Stuart White. And um, on the project, we were working as a group, and we had a group of six student interns as well. So we were divided into two teams. There was a level one team, and we were developing educational materials for level one life science students, and the level two team, they were developing educational resources for level two life science students. Um, I was part of the level one team, along with Sonia and Declan, and the level two team consisted of Lara, Holly, and Jack. Um, uh, we worked very closely together as teams, but we were also supporting each other. So some of the members of the level team, for example, were very good with uh, Moodle and uploading different resources to Moodle. And in our team, Sonia already had a lot of experience with developing educational materials for students. So she was very helpful with that. So for today, first I am going to give you a general introduction into equality and diversity. Some of it was already covered by Lubna. And uh, then I am going to introduce you to our project at the School of Life Sciences. And then I will talk a bit about how could we take our, this project further. So about the Equality Act. So the Equality Act is um, aims to protect individuals from discrimination. It, uh, the Equality Act also protects people if they are discriminated against because they have a family member or a friend uh, who is covered under the nine protected characteristics. So this might mean that, for example, if your son is gay and you are discriminated against because of this at the workplace, you, the Act is going to protect you. Mm, the Act also going, is also going to protect you if you are discriminated against because you stood up uh, for discrimi uh, against discrimination. So here you can see the protected characteristics. So as Lubna was uh, mentioning before, um, we thought that the protect include uh, developing an educational resource about the protected characteristics is very important since the University of Glasgow student body is very diverse. So uh, for example, if we take the age characteristics, we have numerous major students who might face uh, various difficulties because they might have financial responsibilities or um, childcare responsibilities. Also, um, the, as, because the student body is really diverse, um, students come from different races and they might face discrimination because of this. Also, they have, students have different religions and beliefs. So we believe that the student body, in the student body, we can, fi we can find someone who is covered under the protected characteristics. So as I said, the main aims of our project was to raise awareness about equality and diversity issues in the life sciences and beyond. Um, since life science students not always pursue a career in life sciences because they develop different skill sets in data analysis or communication, we also wanted to e equip life science students with skills that will help them to um, face di different barriers in their workplaces. Um, we thought this is important because students come from different countries and in some countries it's normal to talk about equality and diversity, but in some countries it's still a taboo to talk, for example, about sexual orientation. Um, we also wanted to equip, equip students um, to, uh, to have an understanding of opportunities that are available for them because many students come to the university at the age of 17, 18, and they might not know what are the resources and support available for them. So um, as I said, um, the, our main plan was to develop this educational resource for level one and level two life science students. And uh, in this teaching material cover the nine protected characteristics. We are using a pro problem-based approach. So this means that um, students need to solve different uh, tasks and problems related to the case studies that we were developing. Um, an additional thing that is currently being developed is an app, uh, which is going to co uh, co contain all of, the info all of the resources that we were developing throughout this project. 
So the resource itself, it, it consists on, of a Moodle page, both on level one and level two. And uh, in this Moodle page contains introductory videos. These introductory videos introduce students to various aspects of equality and diversity, such as equality and diversity in academia or uh, different types of harassment that students might face. Um, we also developed case studies, which I will talk about later, uh, several exercises and tasks. And uh, we, uh, on level two, there are also discussion sessions uh, through the which are facilitated through Zoom. So here you can see that the equality and diversity, diversity model on this is, which is embedded into the contemporary issues in biology course. This is the level, yeah, block one. And here are all the resources that could be accessed this can be accessed and for ex it's an example side of the introduction presentation that was developed by the level two team. Um, an important part of our resource are our case studies. We developed 10 case studies around the protected characteristics. Um, so we cover age, disability, maternity, race, sex, uh, and sexual orientation. Um, for example, in, in one of the race case, oh, no, actually I will talk about this later. So in the age case study, we cover a story of a student, um, a, st a story of a major student uh, who has several difficulties because uh, he's much older than his course mate. Um, in the disability mental health, health case study, um, we present a situation where a woman, a woman uh, suffers from sever se severe anxiety. So one of, the, one of the other examples of a case study is uh, the case of Tabogo, who is an international student from Botswana. Uh, he's doing a degree in immunology. Um, Tabogo is a final year student and he's doing a research project under the supervision of uh, Professor Ainsworth, who is a very well-known researcher in the field of malaria. And this professor recognizes that Tabogo is very, very talented and he suggests that Tabogo is continuing with a PhD degree. However, Tabogo suffers from an imposter syndrome. He, he thinks that he's not worthy, he's not good enough to do a PhD. So in this case study, we cover a lot of information about imposter syndrome. So uh, the structure of these case studies looks, looks like this on the slide. So we have intended learning outcomes for each case study. Then we have several questions. So in this case, what is imposter syndrome? But we have several other ones as well. We also have an information sheet about the about the person who is described in the case study, so the age of the person, the sexual orientation of the person, um, the gender of the person, and then we have we also have additional resources. So these are resources which are good if students would like to read more about the topic that was raised in the case study. Uh, another important part of our resource are all role model interviews. So we conducted eight role model interviews. Um, these are in a video or in a written format. And uh, we were interviewing undergraduate and postgraduate students and the external research scientists. And we wanted to ask people from the wider community. And we were interested in the barriers that these people were facing throughout their career. And in the ways, how did they manage to overcome these barriers um, we thought that this is important because um, if students see a role model and how this role model overcame the barriers that were presented to this person, it might be easier for them to, um, to overcome the barriers they are facing or, and to be inspired. These videos are three to seven minutes long because we didn't want to make them very long so students are going to pay attention. So, few examples of these role models. I, uh, I cannot show you now because of the time limit, but I will just tell a bit about our role models. So Eve is a University of Glasgow student. She's doing very well in, in her course, but she has a physical disability, so she has difficult, difficulty with moving due to a spinal cord injury. So in, in this video with Eve, 
she's just talking about how did she manage to overcome the barriers because of, he, of her disability and how, how did she manage to become a very successful student. Um, also, Dr. Clara Barker, she's uh, from the University of Oxford. She's a material scientist and uh, she's, uh, raising, she's um, an advocate of uh, issues which transgender people are facing. Um, Additionally, Blair Anderson, he's also a University of Glasgow student, and he faced, uh, he, he went through estrangement because of his sexual orientation. Uh, his family didn't want to accept his sexual orientation, so his story is quite inspiring as well. So the other part of the resource is the app that, that is currently being developed. So in the app there will be the 10 different case studies that we developed, the role model interviews, um, glossary of terms related to equality and diversity, um, the whole description of the project and information about Athena Swan. So this is how it, the app would look like now. So this is just the beginning and some of the Case, these, are, these are the case studies, and these are the role model interviews. So now I'm going to talk about the resource on level one and level two. So the level one consists of an introductory session um, where we introduce students to the equality, general concepts of equality and diversity and uh, different types of harassment. And we also have uh, some of the case studies embedded into a Microsoft form where students can answer questions. Then we have a role model task. task. Here we ask students to describe a person who was very inspiring for them. It, can be, it could be someone from the university, but someone externally as well. And then in the second semester, we also have a career session. And uh, um, in, with our career activity, we want to show students that no, knowledge about equality and diversity can be very helpful for, for them in their work environment because it might be easier for them to cooperate and work well with people from other cultures. Uh, the level two resource is very similar to the level one. It also consists of an introductory session which focuses on equality and diversity issues in academia. And uh, this resource has also four problem-based sessions which are um, coordinated with the help of facilitators through Zoom in breakout rooms, so students have the opportunity to discuss um, the case studies. There are also case study quizzes and Moodle quizzes in this resource and the final uh, wrap-up session. So obviously we would like to see how successful this resource is. So on level one it's not going to be examined but on level two the content will be examined uh, in an exam format in December. Um, we also ask students to complete a pre and post, post questionnaire which will form a basis of a research study uh, and later on a workshop might be organized and the resource might be presented at the learning and teaching conference and it might be written up as a case study. So. Uh, I would like to give a bit about my, talk about a bit about my uh, personal experience, how was it to work on this project, and we started to work in this project I think on the 5th of March, and uh, we didn't know that the lockdown is coming and the pandemic is coming, so we were planning to do everything in person, we wanted to do in-person discussion sessions, so that's what the original plan was, however, after two or three weeks we needed to switch to do everything online. Um, and I was very impressed how uh, efficiently we could switch to online meetings and come up with ideas to do the world resource online. Um, also for me, it was a very unique experience to develop an educational resource uh, because I think before I didn't really, I, I, I always appreciated the effort that my lecturers um, put into a presentation, but now I really understood how difficult it is to create a presentation because even our uh, introduction videos with this resource are 10 to 15 minutes long, but there is so much planning behind each of them. Um, I was also really impressed by the efficient teamwork during this project. Um, if I didn't understand anything or I didn't have ideas, I could always turn to the level two team or to Nicola, Vic, or Stuart, so it was very, very helpful. 
And in general, I learned a lot about equality and diversity, and this is very important for me because I come from a country where it's not a taboo to talk about these issues, but it's not as normal to talk about them as it is in the UK, in the society. And I believe many people come from such countries, and I think for them it will be very good to learn, learn about all these things. And we, ha we got many, many, we got a lot of help uh, from different sources at the university. Um, I would like to thank uh, Fiona Stubbs. She was uh, helping us to develop the career-related activity in the level one resource, and also Dr. Leslie Hamilton, who was helping us with the develop developing different Moodle pages because um, some, of my, some of my teammates, they were very good with Moodle, but um, for me, her sessions were very, very useful. So, thank you. Shall I, uh, shall I repeat the question for the... So the question is, Anna, are there plans to share your app with other parts of the university? Yes, that is going to be shared with other parts of the university. Yes. I'll just hold it. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so yes, the app is going to be accessible uh, for everyone at the university, but also externally, so from other universities. And uh, basically for anyone, it's going to be free to download it. No, it's going to be a separate app. So the question was, is it going to form part of the Glasgow University Life app? No, so it'll sit, it'll sit independently to that, so people will be able to download it from just the normal place that you would download an app, the App Store or Google Play, uh, and it's a free resource. So the university have a couple of apps like that that are, are available to download independently, so yes, it'll sit out with that when it's ready. So no, I think it's a, it's a great app and I think it cuts across all disciplines as well, the, the aspects of it that cuts across all disciplines, so I think it'd be really, really interesting and useful. Just to add as well, we've got interest from the graduate school as well to use some of the resources that we used for the um, level one and level two teams for using the undergraduate le uh, graduate level as well. You can definitely scale up, it's not, mm. the information hasn't been um, lowered because it's for first and second year students that this will transfer across widely. Um, yeah, it goes across all year, year groups. Any other questions? Okay, yeah. It's really interesting. How do students get involved, or is it just for lectures? That's a really good question. So the question was: there are lots of teams across the institute, and how do students get involved? So, as I said in my talk, um, each school and institute will have what we call a self-assessment team that's responsible for driving the Athena Swan Charter, the Gender Equality Charter, but as I mentioned, that many of the, the remit of many of these committees is much broader now. So I would advise you to, to try and, and you should be able to find the information on your school institute web pages, find out who the contacts are, who the lead is for the 
Athena Swan or diversity inclusion group and, and that's one way in which you can express an, an interest and get involved. When we got our ISSF funding uh, for the project that we're working on in the School of Life Sciences, we had six internships that we advertised, and we advertised them through the internship hub that's within the university, and that's where we got the six interns that we were working with. Who, um, all the applicants that we had, we had about 10 people applying, didn't we, Vic? And all the applicants we had were excellent, really good, with a real interest in equality and diversity, and um, showed us that through their CV and during the interview. So I think if you have an interest in this area, there are lots of different ways to get involved. And always keep an eye out in the internship hub because there's more people within the um, MDLS getting ISSF funding and we'll need students to work on them with them. So keep an eye out on that too. Thanks, Nicola. I think that's a really um, important point, and I think the, the training that Karen talks about, so the unconscious bias training that we developed at the vet school, that was the, um, it was a partnership with students, so we had two undergraduate students that was part of their summer project, so again, it was like an internship, they, it was a paid project, so the students, that was the the challenge for them, the project, was to go away and help develop scenarios and film the scenarios. So they, it was a valuable learning experience for them, but we've also got a resource out of it. So it's just, again, just giving you examples of if, you, if you're interested, there are opportunities out there. So do seek them out in your school or institute. Um, okay, good, good question. So there, if a student has a problem, I think it would depend on the nature of that, that problem. So if in terms of bullying and harassment, um, we have very detailed policies and procedures that are all, all the information is available on the university web pages. But I would suggest that your first port of call would be speaking to um, your advisor of studies or speaking to a member of staff that you feel comfortable speaking to and that individual can then direct you to the most appropriate person and I think it, the, it's, it's different people across the different schools and institutions but that information should be all available to you. Any more? Okay. Okay, yeah, a really interesting question. So what level of training do staff get in equality and diversity training? Um, not a huge amount, um, to be honest. We have all new members of staff have to undergo induction and induction training, and they have to complete an equality and diversity training course. And I think it's, um, perhaps it's, it's an hour or an hour and a half long. So it's a specific training course. The staff also have to complete unconscious bias training um, as well and we actually monitor the completion of that through the Athena Swan applications through our charter plan that, that the completion of that is monitored by the staff but we don't currently have ongoing training and development as that's um, for all staff. So staff will seek out that training themselves. So for example, Karen and, and I are both um, doing certificates in diversity and, and in inclusion because we, we, we chose to, but there isn't anything that's a whole rollout for all of the staff. But hopefully over time as we develop these resources, these resources are not only applicable to, to students, they are very much um, of importance to, to staff. So Karen talked about um, one of the resources that we've just developed is about inclusive language um, 
and the sorts of terms that people will perhaps use and they don't know the roots and quite often the roots are set in um, you know, black history and, and they can be offensive but perhaps people will use those terms without recognising that people will be offended by them. So we've created a resource and that resource is, in my opinion, is just as much valuable to our academic colleagues as well as, as the students. when we um, recruited facilitators for delivering these PBLs, that some of them were staff members and some of them were graduate teaching assistants. And I think we all, even though Nicola, myself and Stuart are part of these facilitators, we felt we even developed it even further and we have a general interest in this being the co-chairs of Phoenix Swan. Mm. So just by getting involved in some of the teaching has really helped um, kind of seed those um, key concepts and being able to um, talk about them openly in a safe platform I think is very important. Yeah. Um, I think so if staff are interested in getting involved in something like that is, is a step forward for getting further training. Absolutely. I think it, it's all about progress and I think in, we all have that responsibility to, to make ourselves sort of what I, what I like to call as culturally competent um, just to be really aware and not make any assumptions about individuals and make sure that everybody in the room has a voice.